And here at Vision, we're having a blast for five weeks talking about the series called Get in the Game. Let me give you a quick recap. First week, we talked about serving, about how truly, even in a game, man, sitting on the sidelines, it doesn't get it done. You need to get on that field. You need to take some risk, some chances, be a part of a team, find the way that you're gifted. And here at Vision, we want to use it. Just like Jessica was up here on stage using her talents, first time at Vision using her talents and gifts. And you know what? Maybe you can't do this or do this, but you can park a car. You can help with the kids. You can help behind the, behind the scenes. We want you to get in the game and serve. Second part, last week we talked about getting in the game by giving, by being generous, that we want to be a church that is known by our generosity. We looked in God's Word. We saw a church from way in the past that was even in poverty, in tough times, but they were known as generous, and people were drawn to what was happening in their body. And you know what? Here, here at Vision... I sent out something this week. It was called our generosity list. Not like a wish list, but really a, a list that leaders in our church have built that said, Matt, here are some things we need to move forward in ministry. Like John said, scholarships for our students to go to camp. Uh, a van that we're going to rent to go to camp. Uh, kids' tables. Uh, stuff we're creating environment for our first-timers over here and our care team over here. We built this generosity list. I had one guy, he emailed me in and said, Hey, Matt, I would like to help out in a creative way. He said, actually, I'm going to offer a match. He said, I've got a check that's coming in for $2,600. He said, if people will buy items on that generosity list and give division, he said, I'll match them dollar for dollar up to $2,600. I said, that is generous. So you can go on our website, check out the giving page, and see things like I just described, particularly for our students. We want to take ministry to these middle schoolers and high schoolers, and you can do it. You can be a part of ministry, and what you give the next 30 days up to that, that amount will be matched. It's great. Now, today, we are talking about part three, about inviting people to the game. And I want to talk for a minute about going to a game, because I had a friend, I have a friend, his name's Stephen. He said, Matt, I would love to invite you to go to a ball game. I said, well, Stephen, I, I would enjoy that. He said, because he, he knew that one of my favorite teams of the Duke Blue Devils. Now, I know we probably got a lot of Carolina fans in here. I know that. But, hey, Duke Blue Devils, take a look at Cameron Indoor Stadium. This is where they play basketball up in Durham. It is one of the toughest tickets in America to go to a game up there and see the Duke Blue Devils. So my friend Stephen, he said to me, hey, say, Matt, I don't want to just invite you to a game. I want to invite you to Cameron Indoor Stadium. Would you like to go with me? And I said, I'll take you up on that. So, I mean, today I'm wearing my UT shirt showing off with Vols, but I said, I'll see, I got a Duke shirt at home too. I'd love to go see the Blue Devils play. He said, well, I have an invite for you and actually for your boys too. So check this out. We go to the game. We're sitting right behind the Gardner-Webb bench because he works at Gardner-Webb. He said, Matt, I'm inviting you to come to this game and literally we are that close. And yes, the boys, they were a little bit excited. So we got to enjoy the game that night because we got invited. My friend Steven, he'd invested in me as a person and invited me to go to a game, and of course I said yes. So today we're talking about this whole concept of investing and inviting. And if you, uh, if you didn't get it yet, your takeaway card is in the row right in front of you, or um, you can also get them online with our messages. But this card is for taking notes today and is for helping you during the week. Because ideally, what, the time we spend in here, I want it to be kind of a catalyst, a momentum builder in your life that you'll spend time with God during the week. Dig into these verses, check out these stories, read about them, talk about them with your family, talk about them with your friends about what God is teaching you here at Vision. Because I tell you, if you look around and see, we're bringing in chairs again today, that's not supposed to happen in the summer. In the summer, a church that's four months old is supposed to start kind of tapering, slowing down, people are traveling. We're not tapering, we're not slowing down. So God is definitely working in our church. We want you spending time with him during the week, getting in the word. Today's bottom line, once you take a look at your takeaway or be on the screen, God wants us to invest in people's lives and invite them to come and hear about Jesus. He wants us to get to know people and build relationships with them, not in a manipulative way at all, in a caring way, where we get a chance to invite them to come and hear about Jesus. Now, that can happen in your backyard, or that can happen in your neighborhood, your school, your workplace. We specifically want to partner with you so it can happen here at Vision, that you can invest in someone's life and bring them here. Because when we look in God's Word, we see this happening way back, even in Jesus' time. And we teach about Jesus here. This is the guy who was on earth for 33 years, said he was the Son of God, and we dig in here each week to learn more about him. 
Now, I want to do it a creative way today. Because there's a story about some guys who brought their friend to Jesus. They invested in his life. What We'll call him Alex. And Alex had a certain need in his life. And we're going to hear from a guy that, if you could just imagine, maybe was there a couple thousand years ago, and he saw exactly what happened. So check this out. Good morning. Good morning. My name's Eddie. Uh, and I'm here. I want to tell you a story about my friend Alex and the healing that he got. See, Alex was paralyzed. He couldn't use his legs. He couldn't work. He couldn't walk down to the market. He couldn't go to the ball fields with me and my friends on the weekends, you know. Alex just had a rough life. He couldn't do anything on his own. We included him in all our family meals because, you know, he couldn't fix meals on his own either. And, you know, let's not talk about going to the outhouse. He needed a close friend for that. But, you know, you know but at work, my friends and I, we saw on CNN, you know, the Camel Native Network, that this guy named Jesus, uh, some teacher, prophet, was going around. We come into our city, and he had been teaching a lot of good things. He had been performing miracles, healing people and doing things. They even said that he healed a leper. I don't know if you guys know what a leper is, but it's kind of like AIDS today. I mean, it's just one of those things. You don't touch a leper. That's a death sentence. But Jesus healed a leper. So we thought, man. Let's try, let's get Alex. We can take Alex to meet this Jesus. You know, maybe he can heal Alex. You never know. So we heard that he was going to be at a friend's house, a couple houses up from ours. So that day we said, this is when we need to take Alex up there. But we got to thinking, you know, what's Alex going to say? Is he going to be willing to go with us? I mean, he might say he didn't have the right clothes to wear. He wouldn't know what to say to Jesus. What, how much is it going to cost? Um, you just all kind of object objections, but we thought it was worth the risk to get Alex to meet Jesus because what, you know, Jesus could heal him. So on the day that Jesus was going to be at our friend's house, we made a plan. We got up early. We got Alex up. We got him ready. We took him. We got the got the camels parked, and we got and we couldn't even get close to the house. I mean, people were just shoulder to shoulder. Back, you couldn't even get near the front door. There was no way we were going to get Alex in this house to meet Jesus. But we could hear Jesus in there teaching. We could hear people gasping at the miracles that he was performing. And then it hit me. I had my MacGyver moment. Like, we can't get him in the front door. We can get him through the roof. So we took Alex on his stretcher around the side of the house. And we went up the stairs to the flat roof. And we started ripping and plaster away. We were trying to make a hole big enough to get Alex through this hole. And dust was flying. And I started thinking, boy, I hope my friends have good homeowner's insurance. And then I thought, what's Jesus going to think? You know, is he going to be mad at us for interrupting his sermon with all this ruckus? Is he going to be tell us to go away and come back later? But when we got the hole, finally got it big enough, and we lowered Alex down through the dust, when we saw the look on Jesus' face, our worries, man, they were gone. You know, he, he, he knew that we believed in him. And the first thing he said to Alex was, my son, your sins are forgiven. And I think that first statement kind of caught Alex off guard. But he was already feeling a healing over him. And, and, and Jesus was just, you know, it was a great teaching moment. And then Jesus looked at Alex and said, get up off your mat and go home. And guys, Alex didn't just stand up. He left. He jumped this high. I mean, he was up, running around, hugging Jesus. We were on the roof. We were amazed. We were, I mean, Alex had never walked. Never. And he was running around hugging people. We came down, hugging on Alex. Just a great time and went away. And guys, I'm telling you this story because I know everybody in here has got an Alex in their life. You've got a friend, somebody that needs to meet Jesus for the first time. And to get that healing, to get that forgiveness. And, you know, it's going to be awkward. They're going to tell you they don't have the right clothes to wear. They're going to tell you, you know, I don't fit in with that crowd. I wouldn't know what to say. Or maybe I've been through a divorce and I don't think I should go to church. Whatever their excuses are, you know, we, those can be overcome. Because it's worth it. It was worth it for Alex. And I know it will be worth it for your friends as well. Mm -hmm. 
Okay, well, thank you, Eddie. As I told you, you think about that story that really happened. We believe that. We look in God's Word. We see truth in there. And I believe it's happening every week here at Vision. That people are inviting a friend and bringing them into the presence of Jesus. And we want to partner with you in that. So take a look at your notes. See, the first thing you're going to see with this is that we have to define the problem. We have to find the problem because we talk about deadly diseases. And I appreciate him mentioning that, like, like an AIDS type thing. I did some research about the deadliest diseases in the world. Things like Ebola. Oh, we're all right. Um, things like uh, AIDS, swine flu, meningitis. You know, the number one deadliest disease uh, that's out there actually is malaria. That's, that's killed the most people. And you think, what if, what if you had a friend who had malaria and you knew about that disease and, but you had some type of cure for it. You had an answer for it. The first thing you got to do is realize that person has a problem because literally we have a problem that is much worse than malaria. And some people might want to say, well, we, we make mistakes or we do some things wrong or we kind of err. The reality is it's a dirty word called sin. It's not fun, but Jesus, he would speak to people and clearly say, you have a problem that separates you from God. It's called sin. We have to deal with that. It separates us from him. We can't have a relationship with God until we first realize that problem. So, second thing I see is a strategy. Because here at Vision, we have a strategy. You know, our primary strategy for leading people to Christ, it's simple. It's not long and drawn out and complicated and 12 points. It's actually two words, invest and invite. That is how we get people in Jesus' presence. Now, this strategy, it encourages me that God allows us to do this. Because way back, if you go kind of turn back the clock with me, with me way back in 1991, I'd moved to the South. I'd come down from Michigan. And I appreciate that I had some friends that were down here in Charlotte, and they invested in me. And in fact, my friend's mom, she opened up the Bible and taught me some things to where I said, gosh, I, I don't know God. I maybe know about the Bible or know about God, but I don't know him. And so she introduced me to Christ. I came to Christ in 91, and I start at uh, UNC Charlotte. Me and some friends over there, we say, we need to go tell people about him. I mean, let's, let's go to the mall. We're going to go to the mall and tell people about Jesus. So we go to the mall, and we walk around the mall, and I walk up to somebody, and like, hey. They're like, hey, stalker. Like, what are you, why are you talking to me in the mall? I'm like, uh, do you go to church? Like, no. I don't, and I have to go, and they're gone. I'm like, okay, I feel like a stalker. Like, what is wrong with me, God? I should love doing this. I talk to one more person. It goes the same way, and I'm like, I'm out of here. I'm leaving the mall. Walking out to the mall, get in my car. I'm like, God, if this is the way to tell people about you, then I just, I'm going to fail you. I cannot do this. And what's cool is God said, you know, Matt, some people are wired to do that, but you know what? I've wired you different. And I think the reality is he's wired most people different. He said to me, Matt, meet people in your daily rhythms of life and just start loving them. Just start getting to know them. And in that natural relationship, share my son with them. And you know, here, here at Vision, we wholeheartedly believe in invest and invite. And in fact, we've got somebody in our church who's kind of our, our champion for it. She helps train people even in, in how to share and to look for opportunities to share. Her name is Natalie Parker. And I'm going to bring Natalie up here because Natalie's story you can connect with. Natalie, come on up, girl. And invest and invite is what she lives for and what we live for here at Vision. So, in fact, Natalie, I want to kind of ask you, first of all, what, uh, have you got some type of strategy in this, some type of plan as you and your family try to invest in people's lives and invite them? Yeah, I think that a good way to kind of assess where you are and uh, looking to reach out and get to know people is to see how well you know your neighbors. And there is actually a little uh, graphic we'll look at here for a second. Okay, so do this mental exercise with me real quick. Imagine that's your house right in the middle of that tic-tac-toe thing. Um, if you live in an apartment, that's great. Um, just imagine kind of generally the people that live around you. Um, if you live out in the country, you know, it's trickier to get to know your neighbors, but think for a moment, who are, say, the eight people that live closest to you? Do you know their names? Just think quick, do you know eight of your neighbors' names as you look at that and you kind of think about the people that live around you? 
That's tough one. Oh, come on, Matt. You know eight people. I know some of them. Okay. How about you? How, how do you do this? Okay. Um, well, one more step here. Okay. Uh, think about, do you know something of substance about your neighbors? Do you know where they're from? Are they a teacher? Things that you could connect with them. Thirdly, think about, do you know what's on their heart? Now, we can really love on God's people if we know what's going on um, in the lives of the people around us. Okay, how does this look okay. in my life? How about you? How's, how's it look for you? Okay, I would say about 11 years ago, it would look terrible, and I probably didn't know one of my neighbors, which is really a shame because we lived um, in a condo complex, uh, like in Florida, and they were right there. I could go to the pool. I had plenty of opportunity to meet them, but I can't tell you one of their names. Um, however, something really special happened while we were living there. Uh, there was a group of folks who really were shining God's love intentionally into the people on their path, and I was one of those people, and they had no reason to love on our family. Uh, when we were moving, um, they kind of gave us a parting, going away gift, and um, it just really was done 100% to love on us, and it flipped a switch in me where I could see I was not intentionally loving on anybody. I mean, really outside of my family. I wasn't. There was no difference between my life and anyone around me. Um, I had no fruit. I had zero fruit. <laughs> um, so I intentionally began reaching out, praying to God, God, do a work with my life. Like, I dared to say, move in my life. Okay. Okay, well, how about us? All of us that live in neighborhoods or apartment complexes, how can we do better than this? Okay. Uh, number one is the great command. When Jesus was asked what's the most important thing in the Bible, he said, love God and love his people. And if you take that serious, I think it's easier to realize, uh, it's easier to love on people if you know their name. Okay, so that's a good starting point. So that's why this exercise is kind of good. How many of your neighbors do you know their name? And it's really kind of a mental exercise you can do in all the groups that you're in at your workplace. Think of the eight people, their cube is closest to you. Do you know their name? Do you know what's going on in their life? Do you know how you could love on them? Okay, uh, two more things. Um, one is... You have to be available. Um, and in this day and age, that's a tough one. I mean, we're all busy. And um, just pray about it. Pray about how God would have you spend your time and where you can have more margin. Thirdly, do something. <laughs> you know, really do something. Really share with others something that you love to do. If you love walking your dog, maybe that could be a great way to connect with people in your neighborhood. If you love doing crazy workouts that nearly kill you from exercise, um, like my husband, go with your neighbors to do things like that. Um, I would prefer to bake a cake with a lot of butter and sugar and uh, <laughs> share that to get to know my neighbors. But, you know, we're all uniquely gifted in ways to connect with our neighbors. It doesn't have to look the same. Okay. Any last thought for them then? Any last takeaway? Yeah. Don't feel like you have the weight of the world on your weight of the world on your shoulders. Um, what's happening in people's hearts is it's really between them and God. Your job is merely to love them and help them not be alone in their walk. Okay. All right. Well, let's thank Natalie for sharing and for doing that. So condo with a pool, that sounds nice. Oh, we could use a pool in here today, right? A little hot out. Um, okay, thinking about investing in Vite. Uh, I usually don't do this, but I'm actually going to ask a little bit of participation on this. If somebody at some point invited you to Vision Church, raise your hand. Because I want to see who in here, I mean, like, put your hand up high. Put your hand, it's literally, if somebody invited you, I mean, look, I mean, that's like half the room. Okay, put your hands down. Tell you, the growth that will happen in, in our lives 
comes when we step out of our, our box and invite. And in fact, me and Meg, we started attending church 18, 19 years ago because someone invited us and didn't just assume we were happy or didn't just assume we were okay, but they invited us to church. They said, the reality is there's a problem. There's a strategy. Next piece of it. Number three, the reality. This isn't easy. This is not easy. You think about Eddie. When he went to Alex, there was going to be some type of apprehension, fear. Can we carry him in? Like he said, is, is it too many people going through the roof? What's Jesus going to think? Is he dressed right? How is he going to behave? You know, it, it makes us nervous. And in terms of um, the things we have to overcome, first of all, there's obstacles. There's obstacles to overcome, but we want to help you with that. So in fact, here at Vision, we spend a lot of time thinking strategically about how to remove obstacles so that you can invite people to Vision. First thing we give you every week are available are invite cards. You can see up on the screen, this is the type of invite card we have throughout the year where it's something simple can go in your, uh, your purse, your pocketbook, your pocket, your car, and you can give this to somebody at the restaurant or somebody at school or a friend or a neighbor. Easy way to say, hey, this is where I go. Check it out. Come visit us. Now, what we also do is each series, we design specific invite cards so that you can take kind of the topic or the theme of a series and give that to somebody. We had our first series on Blueprint. You say, man, my church, they're talking about finding vision for your life. Or the second series on Alias. So, man, we're trying to understand Jesus. The third series on Danger Zones. You know, there's all kind of dangers we face. Check this out. Our church is talking about them. This summer, we're going to go through eight different characters in the Bible. Easy way to say, you know, there's all kind of people in the Bible we can learn from. Some were crazy. Some were, were criminals. And once you come to our church, let's check it out and learn how we can learn to be shaped better as characters. And in fact, when you leave today, you're going to have a special invite card to take for Father's Day next week. That you can take it, invite someone to come on Father's Day, and even say, hey, next week we're continuing our Get in the Game series. Man, wear a jersey to church. We're going to honor the dads and the guys. Wear your favorite jersey to church next Sunday. It's an easy way to invite, and we're even going to sweeten it today. We're going to give you a couple little chocolate, little wrapped up chocolate balls to go with the day. Okay? So take those home, share them with your friends, or eat them yourself. But the invite card, we want you to use those. Now we also create little posters, series by series you can take, post it at the gym, post it at your workplace, or where, uh, wherever you can give more visibility to what we're doing. Uh, we design particular series in mind to help you. We'll have a relationship series in the fall, and then another one later in the fall on margin, if you feel like your time is ever tight, or your money is ever tight, or emotionally you're ever on the edge. We design series to help you invite people to come to Vision. We also invite events. You heard about our men's event coming in about two weeks. We want guys to be able to, to be, come to events like that or our students to go to retreats or our kids to go to bashes so that you know you have a church trying to partner with you in Invest and Invite. Now, the next thing is you've got to overcome discouragement because I'm telling you, it's going to happen when you put your mind on inviting someone to church and they say, why do you waste your time on Sunday morning going to church? Or why, why do you, you know, try to get all the kids together and go to that? Or why, why do you even read the Bible or talk about this Jesus guy? Or it's too complicated. And, and you're going to step back and say, man, maybe I shouldn't invite them. Maybe I, and you know what? God's cheering you on saying, overcome that discouragement and invite somebody to come with you to church. Now, the last thing is a lack of belief. Because I tell you, the obstacle of us lack of belief, not the person you're inviting, but literally our lack of belief is saying, God, can you really change that person? Can you really help that person? They're, oh, and they're way, way too much messed up, or they, they're too sad, or they're too discouraged. You could never work in their life, and God says, don't you give up on them. Keep asking them, praying for them, inviting them. We have to overcome the lack of belief. Now, number four, there's a process to this. There's a process. Let me kind of walk you through this. Because first of all, tying into that word believe, we have to believe that Jesus truly is a difference maker that he gets in someone's life, he gets in a student's life, a kid's life, and will change them. We have to believe that to the core. Even when our faith gets shaken and sometimes we can't sense God, we have to believe that. Next thing is, we gotta care. Like Natalie was talking about, I'll say that's tough sometimes. Life's busy, or people are rude, or things happen in your world, we say, you know what, I, I don't feel like caring this week. And God says, wait a second, I cared so much about you, I sent someone in your world. And God says to us, you have to care about that person. Next piece of it, 
We have to be intentional. So I'm encouraging you to do simple way. Take an invite card with you and have it with you in your car, in your pocket. So when that moment comes up and you're at karate practice and someone says, man, it's been such a tough week. I don't know where I'm going to turn for any hope. You say, oh, man, I wish I had an invite card with me. No, actually, you know, I've, I've got one. Let me invite you to my church. You're intentional to look for opportunities to reach out to someone and be a point of need. Next piece, we've got to create the environments. Because here at Vision, I tell you, we have some incredible volunteers. We talked about this two weeks ago. We've created in our preschool, our kids, our student spaces, our adults, the environments they come to, I tell you, your friend is going to love it when they come. We work very hard to create those environments so when you do the ask, we have things ready on this end. And then last, but honestly, it needs to be first, is we have to pray. And this isn't just a, hey God, give me a great week kind of prayer. This is a, actually, I'm going to stop and pray for my neighbor. Because God, I think they're far from you. And God, give me a chance to talk to them and be working on their heart so they'll come to vision. Now I tell you, I, wanna, I want you guys to think about this for a minute. As I prepare for Sundays, I meet with God and get in his word to try to figure out what he wants to speak to me and to you. And this week, as I got in and looked at Luke chapter 5, about Eddie's story about Alex, sometimes you can look at a passage and, and get something from it. And sometimes there's something more. And this, this week there was something more. Because as I looked at that passage, I finished that story, and I said, God, what were you doing before this, and what were you doing after it? And the after, I want to read it to you, because Jesus, after he had this incredible service, if you call it, where people packed his house, and a guy came through the roof, and he got healed, and people are clapping and applauding, and they left. Here's what Jesus did. Jesus, in Luke chapter 5, he went and stopped by and saw a tax collector. Now, this tax collector, I have a, a personal interest in him because my mom named me after him. His name in the story is Levi, but he's also known as Matthew. Now, back in those days, a tax collector was very despised. They were treated, at, you'll even see in different passages, as sinners and tax collectors. So they were like worse than the worst sinners. They were cheats. They were guys who were dishonest. They were selfish. So Jesus, he goes and connects with his tax collector. Now, now take a look at this. In Luke chapter 5, starting at verse 27, it said, After this, after this incredible moment with the paralytic, Jesus went out and saw a tax collector by the name of Levi sitting in his tax booth. Jesus got into his world and said, follow me. Follow me. And Levi got up, left everything, and followed him. Now Levi held a great banquet for Jesus at his house and a large crowd of tax collectors. Can you believe this? Even more tax collectors now come together. More of the scum of the city coming together. The tax collectors and others were eating with them, but the Pharisees... And the teachers of the law, these grumblers who belong to that, that sect, they complained to his disciples. They said, now why do you eat and drink with these guys? Why are you eating and drinking with these tax collectors and these sinners? And I think Jesus kind of paused at that moment. They're all looking at him and wanting to know, why do you hang out with these guys? Why do you invest in them? He said, it's not the healthy who need the doctor, but the sick. I have come to call the righteous, not to come to call the righteous, but the ungodly. And look what Jesus did. He left this incredible moment. People cheering, people getting healed, and he went out and invested and invited. He went into Matthew's presence and said, you know what? I'm going to get in your world. I'm going to get to know you. And you know what? I'm going to try to build a relationship with you. He modeled for us, invest and invite. And when he started that relationship and Matthew said, man, let's, let's go to my house. And as they started going, all, he invites all his friends and said, you've you got to come and see this guy. He is the healer, this, this Messiah, the Savior, and he wanted to get in my world. So Jesus went and invested in Matthew and invited him. And what God said to me, he said, Matthew, I did that for you. I did that in your world back in 1991. I invested in you, and I invited you into the game. So think again about our bottom line. This bottom line that God, he wants us to invest in people's lives and in, invite them to come and be a part of Jesus' world. And I want you to think about this quote. Let me give you this quote. This is from Bob Goff, a gentleman who has a profound perspective on God. I believe he's the kind of guy that sits and thinks on God a lot, and God just speaks into his world. He wrote this book called Love Does, and I want you to listen to this quote. 
says, I used to want to fix people, but now I just want to be with them. Think about that. I just, I don't want to just fix people. I just want to be with them. And Jesus looks at us and says, you know, Matt, I, I don't, I don't want to fix you. I want to be with you. And he says, Matt, take that, that strategy and live it out with your neighbor, with the guys you play basketball with, with the people that your kids go to school with. He says, Matt, don't, don't try to fix them. I mean, just be with them. Invest in their lives and invite them to come and know me. And I want to encourage you this morning. Jesus wants that for you. If you came in here and it's your first time, you say, Matt, I, I don't even know if I understand about this Bible. I don't even trust God. I don't even trust church. I said, that, that's fine. Because I'm just telling you what I've seen. Because I've seen the Alexes who were spiritually paralyzed. And somebody brought them into Jesus' presence and they walked away different. And I have seen what, it, what it's like when God looks at me and says, man, I'm going to stop trying to fix you. I just want to get to know you. All right, if you would just close your eyes for a minute. Let's pray together.